Hi, welcome to the Clipped Stable Isotope Lab video series. In this series, I'm going to provide some background information on stable isotope analysis and some practical information specific to users of the Clip Lab. I'll go over preparation of samples and how to read and interpret results from our lab. In these first few episodes, I'll be presenting a short introduction to stable isotopes and how we measure them. So let's jump right in. I'll be using the term stable isotopes throughout these videos. I'm specifically referring to the stable isotopes of the light elements, hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. These are involved with biological systems and many of the Earth's surficial processes that are important to life on Earth. This diagram gives you an idea of just how wide the application of stable isotopes is and how it extends across many disciplines of science. You'll notice many of these topics are overlapping and interrelated. For example, paleoenvironmental research often incorporates plant ecology, hydrology, and agricultural stable isotope research. The same goes for archaeology, with links to trophic and plant ecology, agriculture, food science, and forensic identification. Much of the work the CLIPT lab is involved with centers around the biological and geological sciences, with research in paleoenvironments, trophic ecology, environmental change, and the medical sciences. If you look at the periodic table of the elements, the elements are arranged systematically in an increasing order, with a number that represents the atomic number of the element. This is also the number of protons that an element has. This number defines the element. For example, carbon has an atomic number of six, so any atom of carbon will have only six protons. Atoms are made up of protons, neutrons, and electrons. The nucleus is composed of positively charged protons and neutrons that have no charge. The number of protons determines the element and its chemical properties, and the atomic mass is equal to the number of protons and neutrons added together. Electrons are negatively charged particles that orbit the nucleus and have negligible mass. The most common form of an atom is composed of an equal number of neutrons as protons. In this example of a carbon atom, we have six protons, which defines the element carbon, and six neutrons, which gives us an atomic mass of 12. However, not all atoms of an element have the same atomic mass. When atoms have the same number of protons, but a different number of neutrons, we refer to these as isotopes of an element. In the case of carbon, there are three naturally occurring isotopes. Carbon-12 is the most common form, composed of six protons and six neutrons. Carbon-13 has one more neutron than carbon-12. And carbon-14 has two more neutrons than carbon-12. If the atom does not undergo radioactive decay, it is referred to as stable, as is the case for carbon-12 and carbon-13. Carbon-14, on the other hand, undergoes radioactive decay and is not included in the types of analyses the CLIP lab performs. An important attribute of an element and its stable isotopes is that all forms of the element participate in chemical, physical, and biological reactions. However, the additional neutrons can affect the rate of reactions or the affinity to bond to other atoms, resulting in fractionations. Most elements have more than one isotope. Here are some examples of the other light elements and the stable isotopes that we can measure in the CLIP lab. For the purposes of this video series, I am going to focus primarily on the isotopes of carbon and nitrogen, since they are the bulk of what we analyze. Note that for hydrogen and oxygen, the same general principles introduced here apply. If you look in the percent abundance column, you'll see that the isotope with a lighter mass of each element is typically the most abundant in nature. Keep in mind that when we compare the stable isotope composition of a sample to other samples, we aren't just measuring the amounts of each isotope in percent to the whole. We are actually measuring the differences in the ratios of heavier isotopes to the lighter isotope and comparing these values between different samples, often out to seven decimal places. 
This requires very sensitive instrumentation and careful protocols, which I'll cover in subsequent videos. Earlier, I showed you a diagram showing the breadth of scientific topics that use stable isotopes as a tool. Why is knowing the stable isotope composition of a sample so useful? As an example, let's take a look at the simplified carbon cycle diagram. I've included the main pools of carbon on the Earth's surface and their average carbon isotope compositions. Note that we express the isotopic values in what we call delta notation, with units of per mil. I'll go into why this is in a later video. For now, I just want you to notice the range of values between different pools. It's approximately 50 per mil. Since different pools have different values, you can trace carbon as it moves through the environment. As an example, you see that C3 and C4 plants have different isotopic compositions. You can infer land use changes by studying the isotopic composition of a soil, since its isotopic composition is determined primarily by the source organic matter inputs. This is a simplified example, but it gives you an idea of how we can use stable isotopes to infer something about the history of an element pool by employing basic mixing models. What gives rise to isotopic differences in the first place? Zachary Sharp described it well in his book, Principles of Stable Isotope Geochemistry. In any multi-phase system, there is a preferential fractionation of isotopes, with one phase preferentially incorporating the heavy or light isotope relative to other coexisting phases. As elements go from one phase to another, whether it is a chemical, physical, or biological transformation, they are subjected to fractionation mechanisms that partition the stable isotopes depending on their masses and bonding characteristics. There are two main types of isotope fractionation, kinetic fractionations and equilibrium fractionations. Kinetic fractionations occur in unidirectional, incomplete, or branching reactions. They are due to chemical, physical, or biological processes and are rate dependent. A common example is the photosynthetic process of fixing carbon from atmospheric CO2 by plants. There is a physical fractionation as the CO2 diffuses into the chloroplasts of the cell, with the lighter isotope diffusing more readily. There is also an enzymatic fractionation as the enzyme Rubisco preferentially binds with the CO2 molecules containing carbon-12. This ultimately results in a carbon-stable isotope composition of plant material that is more depleted in carbon-13 than the atmospheric CO2. Equilibrium fractionations occur between substances that are in chemical equilibrium. These are exchange reactions that are reversible, usually temperature dependent, and occur within a closed system where the products of a reaction are not removed from the system. One of the earliest applications of stable isotopes in the earth sciences was to use the calcium carbonate shells of foraminifera in seawater as a paleothermometer. This is possible because the isotopic fractionation of calcium carbonate with seawater is a temperature dependent reaction. Epstein et al. determined this relationship in the lab, which was then applied to the fossil record to give paleo seawater temperatures. In the next video, I'm going to show you how we actually measure stable isotopes.